Hello, everyone. This is the David Goodman Reality and Truth Show. Thank you so much for tuning in today. My name is Vanita Lambert, and this is my partner, Donna Boyne, who is here every single week with me. And we have a very special guest today, Mr. Jeffrey Fletcher. He is the director of the African American Collections Incorporated. He's going to be telling us all about that. And we also have my NCNW sister, <laughs> Sylvia Bullfolk Martin, here with us again. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming today. Thank you. Um, how's everybody doing? How you doing, Donna? I'm doing fine. You doing good? I'm That's doing it? great. Okay, great. That's to a be short here. answer. We'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> and how are you, Sylvia? I'm doing fine. I'm blessed. I'm just glad I, that you kept the faith in me and Jeff to get this connection going because what he has is very important to get out there to the community. Thank you so much for making this happen. Um, Mr. Fletcher. Yes. <laughs> thank you so much for coming. I know how busy you are. And we really do appreciate you taking the time to come and tell us about this African American collection that's right here in our community. So why don't you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got started okay. uh, with this. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so um, the collection, it, well, my collecting didn't start until the passing of my parents uh, uh, some 10, 11 years ago. My mom and dad, uh, their origins are from the South, South Carolina and North Carolina. Uh, my mom from Camden, South Carolina. My dad from a place called Fuqua Farina, South Carolina. But the, the, the story goes as, uh, as we were growing up, my mom, she would always... Uh, go to tag sales and auctions and there were things that she would pick up and, and there were a lot of times I would often wonder why is she bringing other people's junk back to our house <laughs> and, uh, and, and this, went on for, this went on for years uh -huh. and uh, she wasn't a hoarder of any sort but I, I started to remember seeing her kind of classifying and cataloging different things uh, that she had got along the way and people have uh, donated to her. Um, but they were all uh, symbolic of the mammy shakers, the uh, ad false ad um, negative advertisements about people of color, um, those sorts of things. But still, it did not resonate with me that um, you know, these had some symbolic uh, 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 meaning years down the road, decade down the road or so. So growing up, uh, there were things that my, my mom was doing, not so much my dad, but he would be her chauffeur to take her from point A to point B. And uh, I want to I preface that uh, people would probably, we see these, um, these, uh, these shows that they uh, identify hoarders. My mom wasn't that, as uh -huh. I said. They were all neatly placed and put in containers. So as, we, uh, as I got to college, I'm, I'm one of uh, the four children, um, my brother and sisters. Uh, they matriculated at HBCU schools at North Carolina Central in Durham. Okay. And um, I, was, I was the one that was home. And uh, I would uh, come home from high school. I was an athlete in high school as well. And I would come home and I would see these things accumulating. I actually occupying space in our house where my brother and my sister's rooms were. And I would say, they're not going to be too happy about this. But needless to say, you know, they found a way to managed to stay where they were, where these objects were. And as I got into college, I'm um, a graduate of the University of New Haven, and I was a four-year uh, a student athlete there uh, playing basketball. And um, my time spending at home was uh, kind of delayed because of the, the regimen of being a student athlete and traveling and staying and academically uh, eligible to play. That's automatically five years in college when you're a student athlete yeah. because you have to spread it out, your homework with the, with the games, especially yeah. basketball. Now March yeah. Madness was huge. You can't be doing schoolwork doing March Madness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, 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 was, it, was a, it was a rigorous schedule, um, yeah. but, uh, you know, needless to say, uh, you know, I, I, I fought through it, got through it, and, and when I did have the opportunities to go home during breaks, when we had spring break or summer break or when we didn't make any type of post-tournament uh, bid, um, I would go home and the same stuff would be there, but more of her yeah. objects. And I used to say this to her all the time, because we used to have this running conversation. My mom was 
my best friend as my dad was. Um, and so we would be able to say anything we want to say. So I would look around and I would say, you know, you, you guys remind me of Fred Sanford and Lamont. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and That's it, a good one. <laughs> yeah, and, and for all you all that don't know who Fred Sanford and Lamont, I'm kind of like aging myself, but it's in syndication now on televisions where uh, it's an old, uh, a senior African-American junk man and his son who have gone into business um, just gathering junk and collecting and everything that Fred Sanford was of value, right? So you know where I'm going with this. Yes. And everything I questioned about my mom, I would say, why do you have that? That's junk. And over time, my mom was very, very spiritual. And uh, she was a woman who didn't uh, uh, mince mince her words, but she would get her point across. And so she would look at me, and I, I reside in Branford, Connecticut now, and uh, at the time I was in New Haven, and I was living in one of those luxury uh, 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 townhouses and condominiums, and she would say, you know what, this is my junk. I like my junk, and you know what you can do? You can go back to your luxury condo apartment and <laughs> live in your luxury condo apartment. I love you. You're welcome to come. But this is my junk and this mm. is my world. This is what I like. And it, someday it will represent something and someday it won't. And so with that said, I, um, I took wow. it. I was never one to give any opposition to her commentary or anything that she said. <laughs> so at that time, I, I took all that in stride and mm. then uh, unfortunately, uh, she had a, a, a massive coronary, and she passed away oh, uh, in 2000. And um, mm. see, my dad was still alive, and they had been coming up on their 52nd anniversary of uh, their their marriage. Mm. And so I come from Colchester, Connecticut. And for all you, all of those that don't know where Colchester is, it's up by the University of Connecticut, like right outside the University of Connecticut, okay. which was one of the places I, I was recruited to go to play basketball, but um, it was too close to home. And my parents, I, I wanted to stay in state so that they could see me, but I didn't want to stay too close to home and didn't want to go too far. Um, so that's the uh, uh, geographic location where I ended up uh, uh, matriculating and growing up and that's when my parents migrated from the south to the north and uh, so when they passed uh, I got a phone call and my dad said um, you need to come up and retrieve some of your things now my mom she had collected everything from our elementary school days junior high school days high school <laughs> our caps and gowns our our mortarboards our sashes from our, our colleges any, anything that we had achieved in our lives, she had collected, and we never really took anything. It stayed there. Huh. So for some reason or other, she had the presence of mind, which was, um, to this day, I truly believe that she knew the end was coming. Mm -hmm. um, and she had packed up everything that belonged to my brother and my brother and my two sisters in these huge Rubbermaid bins. Huh. And um, I never knew this. Mm -hmm. And so my dad called and said, um, you need to come home because you have some things here your mother packed up. And I'm like, why would she pack up our things? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when it dawned on me that um, she had a premonition that she would no longer be alive at some point in time during the course of that year. So as I got there, I walked into the, the den and I saw these uh, massive blue bins just piled up, stacked up. And my dad, I said to him, where are my bins? And they were labeled. And my things, I said, he said, right there. I said, oh, I must got two of them. Mm -hmm. And he said, no. He said, there's like nine of them, mm -hmm. and they're yours. Uh -huh. Now, if you, if you know I said my elementary school, junior high, high school, college, and anything uh -huh. that I've had done, um, I said, my life is probably two bins, if that. And he said, no, your mother left some things for you. So I went over. And I started on taking the lids off, and I was looking, and I went, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> and they were the objects that she had wow. collected over the course of the year, I, which I did not say she collected as well as being a child uh, I'm growing up in Jim Crow South. Mm. Oh. Um, That's tough. <laughs> yeah, so I looked yeah. in the bins, and I saw all of these things, and some of the things were familiar. Some of them were never familiar to me because I never 
seen them and were exposed, mm -hmm. or wasn't exposed at the time when my mother and I were going back and forth on what's junk, what's valuable, yeah. what's going to be, you know, yeah. money worthy and right, so right. forth. And so when I opened them up and I said to my dad, I said, this stuff is not mine. He said, yes, it is. Your mother left it for you. Wow. So I had to take a deep breath and I said, there's no way that I'm going to be able to bring this thing, these things back in my SUV. So I had to rent a van, a U-Haul van, mm -hmm. and go back up a week later, mm -hmm. and I transported him back to my home in Brantford, mm -hmm. and my daughter helped me, and we went to my basement, we put them out, and I started taking things out, and my basement was pretty big, and I started laying everything out, and as I'm looking, I'm seeing a sea of just any and everything um, from slavery, from wow. newspapers, oh, wow. um, Reverend Dr. King's uh, assassination, um, uh, shackles, um, uh, uh, mammy dolls, and uh, wow. over an assortment of just things that were mm. reminiscent of African American mm. history. history. That and she collected the, that you classified as junk, junk at the time. Correct. Because okay. my head yeah. wasn't I there. Sure I'm following yeah. the story. Right. Right. <laughs> because my, my head wasn't there. I'm, I'm a retired New Haven, I, I didn't mention, I'm a retired New Haven police officer. Oh, okay. uh, I spent 20 years on the force there. And, and how I met yes. Sylvia was years before that, yeah. uh, going into policing. I met her through the uh, mental health uh, system okay. as a um, mental health worker. Mm -hmm. And she was a mental health uh, nurse, uh, mm -hmm. psychiatric nurse. And That's we crossed right. our paths then. And, um, and, I, and it was, those were good years. Mm -hmm. um, they had some, some highs and some lows. Don't they but, all? Uh, <laughs> it was a process. <laughs> right. and, and I believe we, we go through these processes in order to be where we are today. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, driven. Yeah, yeah. Yes. And, and so as I started to reflect and look at everything that was, I was seeing right there in my basement, this, I tell the story when I do presentations and, the, and, and so forth, I tell people as I'm getting ready to tell your audience, and you, is that as I'm scratching my head and rubbing my forehead and rubbing my eyes, my daughter's looking at me, and all of a sudden I said to her, I think what we need to do is I think we need to call 1-800-JUNK. Oh, no. Oh, yeah, because now I still have that not. That was the last thing I expected to hear. <laughs> well, exactly. well there, was, there, there, there was something that occurred just as I finished that last word, junk. Uh -huh. All of a sudden I had this, this tremendous pain that shot wow. through my neck. Wow. Like, wow. it was almost like, a, it was like, holy mackerel. I said to my daughter, I said, what was this? That was your mother, exactly. right? Exactly. Your mother slapped you. That, exactly. And it was. And, and it was. I called myself that boy. And, and that's what I say. I said it was my mother mm -hmm. kind of like getting my attention mm -hmm. uh, yes. to say, you got to be out of your mind. Mm, right. And so at that your point. Your mother's name was? My mom's name was Ruby and my dad's name was Calvin. Okay. okay. And, um, and, and all of a sudden, my daughter looked at me and she said, Dad, what happened? I said, I don't know. I got to sit down for a second. <laughs> <laughs> that's, how, that's how impactful that, wow. that, that, that awakening was. Yes. Say thanks, Ruby. Got to give you fully. <laughs> yeah, she had my attention. Mm -hmm. And so I, I sat on that for about a week, maybe two weeks, and I said, you know, I slept and prayed on it. And then I, I just kept getting these 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 vibes, these, these messages, mm. um, and, and because you're in mental health, and I was in mental health, I wasn't receiving auditory uh, hallucinations yeah. and going yeah. through any type of post- um, They were real, post like premonitions. They right. were real, they were real. Yeah. Um, and so at that point, I sat down and I said, you know, this is messaging. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I've been put in charge to finish her message carry out her message mm -hmm. um, because she was very, very pro-African-American. Um, uh, she was involved in civil rights back home. And uh, she went, and I tell people to this day when she passed away, mm. um, there were people for blocks, black, white, Hispanic, poor, wealthy, politicians, even her medical team that attended to her mm. at the hospital from uh, St. Francis Hospital. Um, nurses came in, doctors were there, and I just couldn't understand. And I said to my, my father, I said, Daddy, who are these people? He said, these were the people that your mother uh, 
went up, went to bat for at court, wow. went to uh, jail cells. We lived right around the corner from the Connecticut State Police, which is Troop K in Colchester. And so there were people that were incarcerated there, held on, and she'd go up and have them bailed out, be their uh, voice in courts. Um, Wow. And uh, she touched so many lives. Yeah. Her legacy, you got it. Exactly. Yes. And yeah. she exactly. was in the high schools, the junior high schools, mm -hmm. fighting for poor white children who were classified as being special education children. Because we know that the mm -hmm. education systems are, they get money allocated to them for how many special education children that they have in their districts. Yeah. And so there were children that were being labeled that should not have been in those classes. And back then, I'm dating myself, when I was in, uh, in, in junior high and high school, they were actually single lot, singled out, ostracized. Um, they stayed in one classroom and they were ridiculed a lot. And that got to my mom's, my mom's uh, pur in her purview and she would actually go up there and fight for these white black children i remember mm -hmm. those right wow. yeah i remember those special ed classes mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i remember that and they were mm -hmm. and they, they 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 were so much stigma stigmatization on that that Always. um and, and and myth and stereotypes mm -hmm. and and so what she did the culmination of her collection right she she had the presence of mind from when she was a child coming up from the south but she left home at the age of 16 because she comes from a family of eight. And my grandfather lived on a, um, my grandfather, grandmother, and my mother, they lived on a plantation or a sharecropper's property and the oldest children. And I'm jumping all around here because so much is coming back into focus here. And uh, she um, lived on, on, on a sharecropper's farm. She was the oldest of the eight to uh, second oldest. And the uh, sharecropper who was white during harvesting and planting time would come to their house, knock on the door and ask for the two oldest or three oldest to come harvest or plant. So her education was interrupted intermittently throughout the period of her life right. down there. And when she came north um, on her own, she came with my great-great-grandmother who uh, you'll see um, portrayed in, the, in, in what we have now is this African-American History Museum, who was a daughter of a slave and was born a year after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated. She came north with her. And, um, but she lived with Jewish people, my mom, who showed her, uh, gave her more uh, education about family, unity, uh, education. And uh, so she prospered a lot and went through a lot um, as a child and then coming to Connecticut. Wow. So as I had this collection, I decided I needed to uh, memorialize my mother and, uh, and what I did was to start packaging, figuring out how to package this information and take it to where it needs to go. And we're talking the early 2000, 2003, uh -huh. and this was before the 1619 Project, but the 1619 Project has always been in the works. I, I was just a part of coming in on the tail end of mm -hmm. what they have been doing and where they are now. And I didn't know all of this, but um, I had to figure out how to, to get this out here, get this information out here, because it was that history that some of us at this table mm -hmm. um, have not, I didn't get up here in Connecticut. Yeah, mm -hmm. it, you well, yeah, know, it's exactly. so important, the history, it's kind of a familiar story that you're telling mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that was never told to so many others. Right. Exactly. Right. And I can't wait to see it. I just. Right. You know, Black I Black cannot Matters wait to see did. it. Mm -hmm. So t tell us um, the location. Okay. Um, I hate to interrupt, but I, I'm so excited the, the, about it. Yeah. I'm about to yeah. jump out of my seat because yeah. I love this story. Yeah. This is a great very, story. Yeah. 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 Is it so there's, there's just so much <laughs> to it, but I'm, I'm going to, for the, for the sake of not being so time consuming, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I do this in presentations when it was traveling. All, all along the East Coast and uh, South, uh, where it was packaging it and lugging it and shipping it mm. and trying to find people who were going to handle it with care like me. It had some ups and downs, and um, over the years, I just decided that I wanted the brick and mortar to put this in. Mm. And uh, along came the National Museum, which is in Washington, D.C., which I visited mm -hmm. twice, mm -hmm. and that just took me over the edge. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
because as I went there, my daughter uh, and I were looking, and she was saying, Daddy, you have that. Daddy, wow. you have that. Daddy, you have Get that. Get out of here. And I, the more she kept saying that, and I kept saying, you're right. And then I couldn't wait to get back home, mm -hmm. go to my storage area, and, which was my basement, mm -hmm. and <laughs> other places and cavities yeah. in my home um, that I had everything boxed up. And, and I look, and I said, you're right. And then it just became more uh, strong that I'd say we needed a brick and mortar. So as I was doing these presentations, going to colleges and going to various high schools and community mm -hmm. centers, mm -hmm. the town of Stratford plugged in to what I had been doing for the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. And with the help of Sylvia um, making inroads and in coming in here, uh, the high schools have received me at least um, on two occasions um, uh, per year, every year or every other year, St. James School, uh, Bunnell, Stratford High, um, Baldwin the Center, Baldwin Center um, Bird's biggest Eye Bird's Eye Complex. Wow. So to I do your presentation. Yes, oh, wow. and set up displays. So I've kind of I consider myself a a part resident of Brantford where I live, part <laughs> resident of Stratford, mm -hmm. and because the relationship has gotten strong, um, and uh, at that point. Um, I met with uh, the mayor and uh, administrators here in the town, and uh, it took us some time to hash out and figure out, because I'm a 501c3, and um, so that works to the advantage of me wanting to have a structure. Mm -hmm. So to get to that question, Vanita, where is this? <laughs> so we are right here at the corner of uh, East Broadway and Main Street. It is like uh, two houses away, or two structures away, at 952 East Broadway here in Stratford. Okay. Uh, most people will know that this was uh, called the Copperwatt uh, House. Copperwatt. 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 Okay. I, I have, Mr. Copperwatt used yeah. to be my gym teacher when <laughs> growing up in Bequani <laughs> in Bridgeport, and then I ran with him for the second district. Oh, okay. But that was like 1998. And, and his wife. Um, I worked with her. She, she was an RN. Yes, yeah, she Sue. was Susan Copperwatt. Copperwatt. I spoke with her two weeks. I'm keeping in touch. She was excited mm -hmm. about uh, this, this, this journey and this, this project. And the, the thing that I have to, to, to note here is that as I was going through the home with my design people and uh, curators and um, graphic people, people always seem to leave something behind. And in the house was her husband's, uh, looks like a high school portrait picture of himself and a Bible and some other things. Mm -hmm. And to me, that was a message. Mm -hmm. um, because they did, as she shared with me, they did a lot of uh, entertaining of uh, foreign students in the home because he mm -hmm. was an educator. And mm -hmm. um, so I, and I, and I told her that um, the transition is not permanent transition from her home to a museum, but there will always be some sort of place for where their, their lives were that will be identified in this museum because mm -hmm. there was a start and now this is a transition into the museum. Wow, um, this is amazing. Mm. Yeah, so the, the whole uh, project is, um, and, I, and I better say this, um, my sponsor is uh, Sherman and Sterling uh, Law Firm out of Manhattan, New York, oh, which okay. is a um, international and domestic um, uh, acquisition and uh, uh, a merger uh, law firm. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are from all over the all over the world in the United States, and they have been my sponsor and my uh, my answer to my mom keeping her legacy yeah. going on. Wow! With this. How did you get such a prestigious <laughs> sponsor? Yeah. How did that yeah. come about? I mean, um, just from doing presentations and they no, caught um, on or no. And here's the thing: for people <laughs> who amazing, for people who are spiritual. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, and sometimes I get a little uh, 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 emotional, but I, I promised myself I wouldn't today. So it, it's no, you can get emotional. It, I mean, the spirit yes, it's moves you. Real. Yeah, you yeah, can't, can't control yourself. that. It, it, I saw this watching a movie. The spirit yeah. is the spirit. Yeah. Yeah. It comes when it comes. That's so so this, everything is spiritual, and I believe everything <laughs> happens because uh, there are 
angels watching, my mom, my dad, and my mm. older sister who recently passed two years of metastatic breast cancer. Mm. Um, I am so sorry. Sorry about that. I believe they're watching, they have been watching. Um, yeah, but you know what, yeah. there's such, yeah. you know what, this story is touching my yes. heart. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, I can see your passion about it. Mm -hmm. And it's not just something that came about. This is something that started from your mother, mm -hmm. from your mm -hmm. father. It, yeah, you have to yeah. carry this legacy on. Mm -hmm. I cannot wait to, to view it. The grand opening is what, next yeah. Friday? No, no, that's where the spiritual uh, blessing yeah. will be. Oh, the blessing, uh, which we'll, I'm sorry. Which we'll get to. Um, <laughs> I'm jumping the gun, yeah, it's the, not next yeah. Friday. <laughs> no, so, so my, my, my generous sponsor, um, the general counsel for the law firm, uh, his name was Bill Roll, William Roll, mm -hmm. and uh, he oversees all of the attorneys that they have all over the globe in the United States. So oh, I was good. sitting, and, yes, yeah. and to show how this has taken about, I didn't have a special office or anywhere where I could figure out how to do them in, uh, the, the, the tracking or the keeping records of anything, conversation. It was just mm -hmm. my iPhone and my iPad. Mm -hmm. And thank God, during prior to um, the pre-COVID era, I just happened to have put enough information out there in the ethers. And um, Bill Roll, mm -hmm. he calls. And uh, well, we emailed a little bit because mm -hmm. I was throwing my hat out there. And right. he, he connected to um, the email. And next thing I know, we're talking about doing uh, something, giving them an opportunity to be a part of this journey. And uh, they've, um, they've, act act they've been really great. And uh, we're right now talking about the Sterling House because the law firm mm -hmm. was founded by John W. Sterling, who was a Yale graduate and a Columbia Law School graduate who founded, co-founded the law firm Sterling & Sherling in New, New York. And he lived, his summer home was the uh, white home that you see on the corner of uh, Main Street and the families, uh, they donated the uh, Sterling House Community Center as well, All next right. door. So uh, these have been some very, very um, powerful people who uh, want to deliver my message. That is a fantastic story. Yeah, and yeah. oh my goodness, those are very influential people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um, events. So we have, thank you so much for sharing that with mm -hmm. us. Oh my goodness. You're gonna have to have part we, two, you gotta come back on. Yeah, <laughs> when you get time. time. Yeah. We have about one minute left okay. uh, to the show. I'm sorry, it goes okay. by so fast. Yeah. Yeah. What would you like to share with um, our audience about your um, your collection in mm -hmm. terms of when they might get an opportunity to view it and, okay. and so on and so forth and what to look for, your email, your website, and what okay. have you. Yeah, so you would, what, I'm, what I would like, I want to invite the community out to the blessing of the property as well as the museum. Uh, that's going to occur next Friday, which is September 24th. Uh, from two o'clock on. Uh, in, in light of rain, there will be a, uh, a canopy, there will be refreshments. Uh, everybody can get uh, to meet me, my team, and to hear more about this vision and this journey. Um, the opening we're looking, anticipating for October 30th. Um, this is going to be an exciting time, yeah. and it's going to um, uh, Historic. Historic, right. Yes. Historic. And, and the thing is, we don't need to be afraid of this history. Uh -huh. I didn't, manu as I tell yeah. people, I didn't manufacture it. I didn't script it. It uh -huh. is what it is. And, and, I, and I, I hope to get everybody out to support this as well as to come meet me and, and we'll talk. But the next week, things you'll be able to take a tour through just to see the shell uh -huh. and see exact spaces of what is to come. Uh, in October. Well, thank you so much. I will definitely be there. I want to thank you, and you're welcome back anytime. We're out of time. This is the David Goodman Reality and Truth Show, and we're on your side.